So, we were researching racial inequality in the housing market. And the main metric we used to understand it was median house value. Next slide, please. So, coming into this, we aim to answer one big question. Does the racial composition of a neighborhood affect the median value of houses within it? And if it does, how? To answer this question, we employed one strategy. We looked at differing variables, like the local quality of education, the home age, the population density, and we analyzed how they might contribute to the value of a house in the neighborhood. And at the end of the day, we found that no matter the job index or the environmental quality, the neighborhood's racial composition stood out and continued to be a determining factor in its median house value. Next slide. All right, so uh, for, our, um, for our data, we use a number of different data sources. Uh, so uh, the first uh, data source that we used for our independent variables is the median number of rooms in a neighborhood which is the average number of rooms of all the houses in a particular neighborhood. We also use the median home age in each neighborhood, which is the average age of all the homes in a neighborhood. Then uh, we looked at the white and black population in each neighborhood, which is derived from overall population and white and or black population. And with that, we create an integrator variable to determine if a neighborhood was majority minority or not. We also had a number of indices, health and environmental quality, education quality, jobs, and social and economic quality. These use a, a wide array of raw data to form an indice that measures uh, these elements as a whole. Uh, the last independent variable we used was a population density. So this is the amount of people on average in a particular area. And uh, for this, we had to transform it from meters squared to square kilometers, as otherwise the data will have been illogical. And from that, we also transformed a population into population density by adding the area factor. Uh, as Karsten mentioned earlier, or dependent variable here uh, is the median home value, which is the average value of all the homes in a particular specified neighborhood. Next slide. So this group used a multiple linear regression method in order to answer whether the racial composition affects its median house value. The regression equation that we used was y equals a plus b1 x1 plus b2 x2 plus b3 x3 plus b4 x4 plus b5 x5 plus b6 x6 plus b7 x7 plus b8 x8 plus e. The y in the equation is the dependent variable, the a is the intercept in the equation, the b's are the slope parameters, and the x's are the independent variables. Majority minority is the indicator variable in this equation, so x8 is the indicator variable, and a zero um, means it's not a majority minority neighborhood, and a one would mean it is a majority minority neighborhood. Finally, at the end of the equation is the error term, which allows room for measurement errors and unpredictable errors that may happen. So in the equation, x1 is the median number of rooms, x2 is the median home age, x3 is the education quality, x4 is the jobs index, x5 is the health and environment quality, x6 is the social and economic quality, X7 is the population density, and X8 is the majority minority. Next slide. <clears throat> All right, so for results, um, one of the first variables that we looked at when looking at the relationship between um, the median house value was the median number of rooms. Um, and this slide just kind of shows what we found. So this is the regression analysis chart. Um, so like I said before, we ran a linear regression for each variable, um, and we can see that the dependent variable, as I said before, was the mean house value, which kind of represents the uh, racial inequality in the housing market. 
Um, and you can see that the variable that we used first was the median number of rooms, which is on the left of the top uh, regression analysis. Um, and looking at our linear regression analysis also, we saw our R squared value, which basically explains um, how much of our data can be explained by the, um, I guess, the line or explain the dependent variable. Um, and that was around 36% of our data. Um, and on the right, you can see a scatter plot. Um, and we chose a scatter plot because it was kind of a good way to show the correlation. Um, so you can see that it's kind of upward sloping, which is in par with what we found in the regression analysis. Um, we can see that the number 15,673 um, and 38 cents, that shows that for each additional room, the house value tends to increase by that amount. Um, so from that, we saw that there is a positive correlation between the median number of rooms and median house value. So as number of rooms increase, the house value typically increases as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so we also had other factors that also showed positive correlations. Um, so other variables that we saw having positive relationships include the local school quality, um, availability of jobs, and socioeconomic factors. Um, and this slide just kind of shows the same thing as the last slide did. So on the left is local school quality. We can see that with the regression analysis that we ran um, for every one unit increase in education quality, um, the median house value tends to increase by around $573. Um, and we can see that the R squared value is around 51%. Um, so it shows that 51% of the data points can be explained by our equation. Um, and you can also see the graph that it shows a positive slope. Um, so if you were kind of just like eyeball line through all the data points, um, you can see it goes up. So as one unit of each local school quality increases, um, the median house value tends to increase as well. Um, and the same concept also applies to the availability of jobs. Um, you can see that as the availability of jobs increases each unit, um, the median house value tends to increase by $639. Um, and for this one, we can actually see that the R squared value is super, super small, um, which explains why in the graph, it's kind of hard to eyeball um, a best fit line, but when we ran it, we found that it had also a positive correlation. Um, next slide, please. So this slide shows the last um, positive correlation socioeconomic factors, um, and it's kind of the same concept as each unit of socioeconomic factors increase. Um, the mean house value tends to increase by $651.74. Um, Next slide, please. So back there, we talked about positive correlation factors, um, but we also found negative correlation factors. Um, so there were two variables that we found had negative correlations with the mean house value. Um, and the first one was the mean house age. So it's kind of the same format as the positive correlation factors. Um, we can see that the number is actually negative this time, um, which means as each year has a mean house value, I mean, mean house age um, increases or the house gets older, um, the mean house value decreases by around the value of $838.74. Um, um, and in the graph, we can see that if you kind of eyeball um, a best fit line with all the data points, it kind of slopes down, which is in par with what we found in the regression analysis. Um, and for the last variable on the right is a majority and minority neighborhoods. So that was looking at the percentage of white, white people or black people in the neighborhood. Um, and we can see that this one by far had the greatest difference. Um, we can see that as the majority, ma majority, sorry, majority minority, um, as each unit increased, the mean house value tended to decrease by $22,213. Um, and for this one, 
I actually chose to use a histogram because it kind of shows um, how low the median house value is in the majority minority neighborhoods. So these were neighborhoods that were um, mostly consisted of minority groups. Um, and we can see that around 60% of the majority, majority minority neighborhoods, their mean house value was somewhere around 100,000, um, a little bit lower than that also. So that was very low compared to what we found for um, majority white neighborhoods. Um, so that kind of showed that it was st statistically significant um, that there was a lot of racial inequality um, in the housing market. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this was basically what I just talked about. So what can we conclude? Um, while looking at all the variables that affected the mean house value, um, even while controlling for other factors, um, there was still a huge difference in terms of house value um, with neighborhoods that were majority white or majority minority groups. Um, and it was around a $22,213 difference on average. Um, and with this data, we can conclude that there's still a lot of racial inequality in the housing market, which not only economists, but we also need to pay attention to. Um, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so when we are, sorry, um, when we have finished, you know, collecting our data and analyzing it, we have to critique our data. It's not going to be perfect. So first we want to talk about what are the limits to our data? Are there new variables that we need to add? What is the scope of our data? Uh, Greg will talk about this in the next slide, but our data is just from the Cleveland area. So if we wanted it to be more universal, we would need to collect data from, you know, other towns, other counties, other states even. Um, if we wanted to, again, just look at the Cleveland area, but maybe make sure that, you know, our data is really as good as it can get, you might want to add some new variables you know, some things that we were talking about were maybe talking about if it is an urban, a suburban, or rural area, maybe talking about how close it is to, you know, public transportation, talk about if this is in an apartment or a house, but really just adding some things that could affect how much a property is worth. We, um, we did come across some of what we called unexpected results, and those were two variables that did not have a great enough, uh, sorry, a small enough p-value to be considered um, significant. So the first was environmental factors, and we found that, you know, environmental factors was not significant. And then the second one was population density of an area. And that one also was not um, significant. And we, when discussing why this was, we linked them to other uh, variables that we already had and said, oh, you know, population density could be explained by these variables and um, environmental factors could be linked to these ones. And then when we're doing an analysis or study, we have an obligation to share our data. And if we see an issue that arises like how homes in um, majority minority neighborhoods are valued less, we have an obligation to, um, you know, put a stop to it to introduce policies that will aid 
and making sure that that does not continue to happen. And although it's not just going to take one policy, some ideas are fair housing laws, which make sure that discrimination in the housing market does not continue. And then grants and funds to renters to make sure that they are able to purchase their homes, are able to renovate their homes if they see fit. Basically make sure that if um, one deems it necessary, they are able to increase the value of their home um, instead of just, you know, sticking with what it is now. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of build on what Caleb said. And so um, when we had our, our data was, um, we actually simplified it down to just have Cleveland area neighborhoods. But if we wanted to um, make sure that this result applies to everywhere in the United States, we would want to add neighborhoods from different uh, cities, states, counties, as uh, Caleb mentioned. And within that, we might, even be able to find some differences. If you know anything about Cleveland, Cleveland has an older housing stock. It's a, a Rust Belt city. Um, we might want to look at regional differences. Is, it, is Does this result differ in Cleveland, Detroit, and Pittsburgh versus Houston, Phoenix, and Albuquerque? And so that's the, the merit looking at. Not only does this, this result apply to other cities and all over the nation, but does the extent differ based on region or um, any other factor we might find? And so if we really for us, the number one thing we wanted, we would want to do next is add more, um, add more data from different cities. And so uh, in that we might find that environmental factors are now significant or population density um, is maybe significant or not wrapped up necessarily in another variable um, because what we found might be specific to Cleveland. We have to do more research to know if it is not. And so I want to expand a little bit on what um, Caleb mentioned as far as And so we might want to look at the different experiences within minority groups. So um, the difference in extent between Black, Latino, Asian, um, majority um, neighborhoods. And uh, what, is, what are the differences there? Is it greater, is it less, or is it about the same? And so that could be an interesting place to look into. Okay. Uh, finally, policy implications. So I want to go into a little bit more depth about what Caleb said about fair housing uh, laws. Uh, right now, that's what we have on the books, mainly to account uh, for racial inequity in housing. And one area that's gained a lot of attention lately is um, discrimination in housing appraisal, the housing appraisal industry. And so um, there hasn't been a lot of research into is there persistent discrimination in the housing appraisal industry. But there has been some local, state, and federal action on it. Um, for example, uh, the city of Columbus, which is in Ohio, has a commission that's working on combating discrimination in housing appraisals. Uh, Illinois and New Jersey both just passed laws that uh, make it easier to revoke the license of an uh, uh, appraiser if they're found to be persistently discriminating or sue them in a civil case. And then um, the federal government is working on releasing appraisal standards um, so that they can more they can better enforce fair housing laws. And then another thing that's being proposed, kind of what Caleb was saying with grants and funds, not just for improvement for homeowners, but also there's um, for down payment assistance. And 
it helps with affordability and home ownership. And there's some evidence that when people, uh, when we have higher rates of home ownership in majority minority um, communities, that property values uh, increase at a greater rate because people, um, when people hold on to their homes, it's, it, they're more likely to put more care and et cetera into it so that the rates increase. There's not enough research to know if this would have a significant impact on the, the racial disparity, all things held the same, but um, it's definitely, these are, there's not one cut solution. This is a very complicated issue. And what we did is just start to look at what might be the causes. You can go to the next slide. Okay, just a quick sort of wrap up what you should go walk away with. Uh, out of all of the variables we tested, um, we found that the racial makeup of a neighborhood affected the value of a home the most, um, averaging about $22,000 less than in a, um, in a majority minority neighborhood than in just a majority neighborhood. And not everything you expect to change the median home value actually does. Like we found the environmental factors and the den uh, pop population density didn't affect that at all. Um, so stuff we can do in the future is expand the research to more than just Cleveland and we can test how um, or test the generalizability of these results if it's for, you know, broader places or just Cleveland. And something else we can do is looking into fair housing laws and discuss and improve um, stuff to make uh, this inequality uh, disappear, hopefully. Um, that's all, thanks for listening.